I'm Jean, and this is Perfect Flow. I'm a New Zealand-based athlete and coach focused on optimizing performance, health, and well-being. While I have a professional background in biomedical engineering, I've chosen to follow my more immediate passions for running, endurance, adventure, movement, nutrition, lifestyle, community, psychology, and personal growth. My goal in starting this podcast is to connect with bright minds to extract the information I need to live a life that makes sense and feels good, and share those conversations with others. Apart from your favorite podcast app, the best places to follow my work are perfectflow.nz, genebeverage.nz, and perfectflow on Facebook. What's up guys? Today I'm talking with Sean Collins. Sean and I go way back because he started just like me with orienteering and then began to move more towards ultra distance running. Uh, recently he's uh, completed the Revenant, so he was the first person to do so in its second year running. He's also quite well known for stunts such as the Trillery or three times over the Hillary Trail in Auckland. Uh, he's also a race director for Lactic Turkey, so he's very well embedded into the running scene in New Zealand and I'm sure a lot of people um, love his personality and the energy that he brings. We're talking today about mindset in ultra running, talk about the Revenant and the challenges that he faced and the success there. Um, also a little bit about his low carb approach to fueling and then we go down the rabbit hole of meditation and other potential hacks to the the mental side and the psychology of taking on these pretty immense races. I hope you enjoy it. Hi Sean, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, how are you feeling? Were you a little sick the other day? Oh uh, yeah, I just had a, I think it was a little virus at my uh, mm, youngest no, head. No flu-like <laughs> symptoms, no cough? No, mm. <laughs> nothing like that. Yeah. Just a head, just a headache. All right, all right, that sounds good. Um, and I'm surprised you're not busy doing the quarantine, quarantine ultra. Oh uh, yeah, I would love to. Um, the uh, but yeah, I'd want to do it properly, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have, if, have if, you I start, taken a look? if I start, I'd like to go for go for long, but mm -hmm. um, don't want to do that at the moment. I might, yeah. I might do something next weekend. I might do a hundred k or something around okay. there. Yeah, we've cleared the run. track on our property. <laughs> How big is your loop? Uh, it'll be between four and five hundred meters. Okay. But through uh, bush and on a bit yeah. of a slope, so there'll be quite a bit of climb. Normally, I'd say that's pretty short, but I think the standards for short loops yeah. have, have changed considerably. Oh yeah, there's some crazy ones out there. Down to as many as seven meters per loop, or whatever the, <laughs> that yeah. dude's dining room was. Yeah. Ten meters per loop. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, but it it begs the question: uh, how, how much of this nutty sport uh, is is mental, and how much is physical? And I think that's something you've been interested in quite a bit over the over the years. So, um, yeah, well, what are your thoughts on the difference between doing the a challenge like that? outdoors and indoors and after a certain distance does it does it really matter being indoors obviously it's going to be way more mind than body um and like even those guys on the treadmills like um that's hard out on the on the head rather than the body i think um so it's going to come totally down to the mental side mm -hmm. um a lot earlier than it would if you were out doing the the normal 6.7k loops i think because you've got distractions that are um, that you can zone out on, and other people to talk to and stuff that that distract the head from uh, from uh, putting bad thoughts in your mind, <laughs> telling you yeah. to quit. Yeah. So is that what you think it comes down to? Have you noticed that while you've been on some of your longer runs that the frequency of quit quit thoughts uh, gets higher under under certain circumstances? Uh, yeah, I think it's the the longer you go, um, the more I think the more your head becomes susceptible to to listening to those things, because mm -hmm. um, yeah, 
I guess you start to zone out all the other stuff because you're so tired. Yeah. Um, and so then you're putting up with your, your head talking to you, telling you different things. Mm-hmm. Um, so overcoming that's the key, I think. Yeah. Like I haven't done um, anything anywhere near as long as what you have done, um, but I have done a I, I did a nutrition test uh, at Millennium at the end of last year, and part of that was a 90-minute uh, run on a treadmill um, as part of a glycogen depletion protocol. And yeah, I was doing four minutes per kilometer on on the treadmill, which is a pace that I regularly run on the road and for some reason it was it was horrendous and <laughs> yeah. and i had myself at 50 minutes into this 90 minute thing being like this is going to be so embarrassing and of course it was um andreas ramonis was doing the study <laughs> yeah so he's like so he had a kind of a rival, <laughs> was a rival of mine like and i'm like how am i going to do this am i going to have to pull the pin in front of andreas because this four <laughs> minutes a kilometer is too fast and of course, he's chosen that specifically based on my VO2 max and, and some other things. And yeah, the, the thoughts were just coming. This is too hard. This is, I can't handle this. How much longer? And yeah, I've never even felt that doing any of these longer five hour runs. Never noticed that. And then on a treadmill, yeah. not even anywhere as long. So yeah, I think there's something to, to what you're saying about uh, being being confined to not not be distracted by um the environment and especially in a race as well do you find that doing the training runs are harder than in a race uh yeah i think yes because in a race you've got the the distraction of uh you know potential competition and the excitement and adrenaline that you have as part of the race process um so i think that helps distract you um it's it's funny though because same what we've just said <laughs> um at the revenant this year that i just did like i had all these i'd been researching for like you say quite a while now this side of things um you know reading as much as i can and practicing some stuff and thought i had a good toolkit with everything that i'd need to if it ever came but it, it never came up um and uh i did uh what was it like um two and three quarter laps by myself so there was no distraction of talking to other people um but somehow i was just in the zone that there was that i want to quit never came up mm. yeah and, and that, so that's hard that's hard to explain <laughs> yeah it's certainly hard, hard to explain other than the fact that at least i noticed this in myself there is this kind of ego drive on race day. I know others are watching and there's just nothing that if there's something that I can do to not look like a complete munter, then I will do it on, on race day. And it, it seems effortless to make those kind of decisions on race day for me. Um, yeah. I don't know what else, what drives other people, but yeah, I, I also noticed that on race day, there's just, nothing gets gets left left out it's it's everything gets um left on the line and in training that's not necessarily the case there is a mental battle in training so yeah congratulations on your effort at at the revenant so perhaps you can um talk us through a little bit about that race for maybe those that haven't followed it um you, you did it last year and this year you managed to be the first person to complete it so um, how has that race been a, a priority for you? And I'd be keen to hear the full story of, of this year's race and what such an event in New Zealand uh, means to you. Yeah, so the um, the Revenant is, uh, I guess you could say it's New Zealand's version of the Barclay Marathons. Um, as much as it has quite a few differences, um, so in itself is unique. Um, it's advertised as an ultra adventure run. Uh, so you do um, four loops, and they're about 50k each, with, uh, advertised as 4,000 metres vert per loop. Um, and it's not a fixed course, so um, you're orienteering, um, navigating between um, the 14 checkpoints out on the course. 
and that extra point is a, a wee book that you're about your correctly numbered page to prove that you've been mm. there. Uh, so, so so far that's just all out of the, the Barclays playbook really. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's, it sounds all pretty similar, rugged, rugged terrain, not a yeah, formed path down, the whole uh, way. It's down uh, just south of Queenstown um, in the hills. Um, so lots of tussock land and uh, Spaniard um, thorns to stick into you. That's the, and, that's a really sharp, long, spiky one. Yeah, yeah. yeah and they uh, leave a little bit in you every time. They yeah. <laughs> spiky. They're sharp, man. They are so sharp. Yeah. Um, and like yeah, sometimes and you jump over them and think you've got over them and they get you yeah, in the back of the leg. Yeah, like. bro, that is it. <laughs> that is it. And um, I've had friends get numerous punctures on their on their bike. Yes. Uh, with those guys, so I've, I've had um, uh, a friend of ours. I think it was Tom Reynolds ended up. I think he got three punches in one ride or something. Yeah. And it didn't have sufficient tubes <laughs> because he kept <laughs> kept just just clipping these things. And yeah. Um, yeah, no, they're crazy full on things. And then the tussock's really thick in most of the terrain, so you're sort of running over the top of it. Um, last year we started in like a, a thick fog, missed it like midnight, and you know, five minutes into it, literally our whole bodies were soaked because of all the water that this tussock was holding mm, yep. um, that we'd have to go through. Um, so yeah, the, the differences to Buckley's are um, this one's totally self-supported. Um, so you're given a, a 70 litre um, gear bag allowance and at the end of each loop you get given your bag and you have to mm -hmm. sort yourself out for food and right. water and all of have that. Have you seen the Barclays movie? Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that showed some insight into how much support they're actually actually years on that race um and obviously it brings a different dynamic uh into it you can play the strategy a bit do a bit differently but yeah that that's a difference i didn't actually realize that they were making uh the revenant a a solo yeah okay and so it's it's really weird when you're in the um transitions between loops because there's like your family and and um you know support people around and they're just like watching you <laughs> <laughs> watching and, you suffer but can't help yeah and like the first lap's really weird because people don't sort of know the rules like um you can't tell people i oh, don't forget your head or head torch or whatever um because that would disqualify you because mm -hmm. um, it's counted as support but yep, sort of as, yep, as time yep. goes on you know they actually talk to you and ask you questions and hug you and and that sort of thing so okay. it becomes a, a bit less weird <laughs> <laughs> And then um, there's no watches, um, so you're not allowed to watch. Um, oh. Obviously, obviously you're that... not allowed any electronic um, aids for navigation, but the watch is different mm. to Barclays. Barclays. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a twist. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that makes it tricky. You kind of um, rely more on daylight hours and watching the yeah, sun Yeah, you've seen the sun. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there is um, some watch. There's uh, two or three watches out there on the course at the checkpoints. So you do have a little bit of a snapshot at time at various okay. points. And just to <laughs> muck with you head a bit more, each of those is not real time. Um, it'll be like three hours 20 behind or something. And it says that this watch is three hours 20 behind, but it's still after running right. for so long, quite a calculation. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> what is time then? <laughs> so you sort of don't use those too much as you get further on that's funny it becomes uh, it becomes too hard to work out <laughs> to do a, a basic <laughs> subtraction or addition calculation after 20 hours of running yeah yeah um yeah and then uh there are oh so it, the revenant does allow teams so there's there weren't many this year actually i think there's only about two teams of two people that do it all together mm -hmm. <clears throat> So they're staying together the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess they're having company um, and then everybody else is solo. Mm -hmm. And is there that veil of secrecy <clears throat> over the course, like at Barclays? Is there what, sorry? That uh, kind of veil of, of secrecy about where the, the course, where the course goes. I, I, I think I recall after last year there they were saying that people shouldn't shouldn't share the course or yeah or like um, over overestimated the something 
No, that is right. The checkpoints, um, they stayed the same between this year and last year, apart from um, a few corrections to where the actual, um, or the circle on the map was, or the actual uh -huh. physical okay. checkpoint. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, the basic structure of the course was the same. Mm. And yeah, they kept that a secret. Um, okay. And then you don't know which direction you're starting, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll meet uh, each loop that changes direction. Yep. Cool. And how long did you take to finish it? Um, so I was 58 hours to do the, the four loops. Um, huh? So last year, nobody finished um, within the cutoff times. Um, mm -hmm. So one person, um, Al Sheldon, uh, did manage to do two loops, but he was well, well outside the, the um, 30 hour time limit. Um, right, so they're not know. cutting you at 60 hours. They're saying you're you're not on track to make it, so they're pulling pulling people yes. off the course earlier. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so this year, um, there was uh, what was it? I think there was seven of us that managed to do that 30 hour cut off, mm -hmm. um, and then three of us finished. Um, so there was two guys that finished in front of me. Um, Angus and Lewis, um, they finished a couple of hours in front of me and they ran together the whole way pretty much mm -hmm. um, to the extent that um, on the last lap when they tried to have a sleep, um, Angus managed to, an hour's sort of lay down or sleep and um, Lewis sat down next to him and couldn't get to sleep so ended an hour just watching, <laughs> <laughs> watching <laughs> Angus sleep for an hour. Uh... Um, but after running together so long, they wanted to stick together the whole, the whole time, which is, okay. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does remind me of the Barclays movie a little bit. There was a lot yeah. of that going on, uh, and it sounds yeah, quite strategic, start, was... right? Yeah, it sounds quite yeah, strategic it... when you might as well stay with somebody else if they're, um, if you can use each other until the time is right for one person to, to, to push off. But yeah, don't. Don't waste the opportunity when it when it arises. Yes, and it, it was really interesting this year, being the second year that um, there's a whole lot of um, virgins or newbies, and and then the veterans of us that um, started last year, and um, there's some different groups that formed at the start um, of the newbies flipping in with veterans to try and hang on for the first you know few loop or something to get the navigation sorted. Right. Right. Yep. And that's what happened. I had a, a wee group that I'd, um, Tom, Hunt, <laughs> Tom Hunt, who I'd been yeah. training with. Yeah, right. Um, Someone strong enough, knows who you are, can follow, can hold on to you, and then gets, yeah, yeah. gets a glimpse of the course without the risk of totally blowing it. Yeah. And we had four of us that, um, that had sort of grouped together at the start. There's Tom Hunt and myself and Katie Wright. Um, and um, Jonathan Ash, um, but in the the chaos of the start, um, it was pretty fast and furious for the first checkpoint, um, which is like a 600 meter vert drop down over a couple of k's mm. to the first checkpoint. And by the time we got that, and um, it was just Tom and I <laughs> out of that group of four, because um, Katie had um, twisted her angle and Jonathan had. Oh. had left something behind at the, oh. at the checkpoint um uh. so by you know sort of 4k into it then it, the plane's totally out <laughs> yeah and there's tom and i and we hooked up with the the navy seal dude um chad from the states uh -huh. yeah and we stayed together for most of the um or three quarters of the first lap until chad started suffering in the heat mm -hmm. Because um, it was uh, in mid thirties, um, yeah, with hardly any cover, and he started cramping. Which seemed to be the the common demise of people this year was the heat. Okay, yeah, that um, Otago gets pretty hot, or the, um, that southern part of the South Island it gets surprisingly hot in summer, doesn't it? It's yeah. certainly been been yeah, the demise of me as well a couple of times in the past. Just yeah, just coming from Auckland where it doesn't quite get that hot. I mean, just underestimating how how hot and dry it can be down there. Yeah, and usually I'm, uh, I hate the heat. Um, I'd much prefer to run in like, really cold temperatures. Um, 
and was surprised that I handled it reasonably well. But then uh, my wife reminded me that in that we had a hot patch at the end of November, early December, um, where I was working at home for a couple of weeks. So I managed to get out like midday and um, just sort of acclimatised to it a lot better than I have in the past. Okay. So doing all, doing all my training runs midday in the heat. Mm. So that meant yeah. all I had to do on the on the race was um, the body was used to it. So I was just whenever we got to a stream, dipping hat and and shirt into it to yep. stay as cool as you can, cool cool down the uh, the cool temperature in the head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important discipline to sacrifice those few seconds for that that long term sustainability. Uh, what were you consuming as far as fluids? Uh, so, uh, so water, which there's reasonably plentiful supply out of the streams and that. Yeah. Um, the biggest stretch was probably three or four hours where you didn't have um, a stream that you could fill oh, yeah. up with. Oh yeah, yeah, that's solid. Um, so, yeah, so it's quite helpful. And so I was, yeah, water and tailwind um, electrolyte drink mm -hmm. um, was the staple throughout. Mm -hmm. And what about food, solid food the rest of the time? Do you often use gels or do you prefer to use whole food? Uh, I prefer to use whole food. Um, and um, yeah, I was surprised how little I ate over the whole time. I had sort of a bag of um, mixed nuts, um, which I'd nibble on throughout the loop. And mm -hmm. then um, uh, some wraps with some nut butter in it. So does that sound like you're taking more of a fat burning approach? Yes, and it's okay. sort of over the last couple of years um, developed that, um, and then um, yeah, can of uh, tuna each lap, okay. and I think I had maybe two or three gels a lap over mm -hmm. the fifty k per lap, um, just when like low points, um, uh, where I was sleepy or whatever to help come out of it. Have you been playing around with? With low carb throughout other periods of the year or is this, this something that you're just pushing on some of these longer runs uh yeah not in lots of my training i do first thing in the morning so yep. without any any food and then on the longer runs yeah i wouldn't eat till um till a decent amount of time in it mm -hmm. for training and it would be yeah try and be the nut butters and things um, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> foolishly um, uh, two weeks before the revenant um, my wife and I decided that we'd go we'd try in our main diet to go low carb yeah um, and I didn't have any ill well, I don't think I had any ill effects from that but um, read it afterwards once my wife um, was getting a little bit um, sick or uh -huh. not sick, but just low. <laughs> that yeah. um, usually that two to three week period, you do feel a bit shit till you, your body gets into it. Yeah, I think it took me about six weeks actually. Yeah. To um, so I've yeah. been on a ketogenic diet for like four months now. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it's it took me it took me a while. I think about six weeks until I could actually like make breakfast in a reasonable amount of time. I was oh, really? really like I was so dead in the morning, like basic maths was just impossible. <laughs> R like remembering the sequence of events to make a coffee and prepare breakfast was. I found myself just standing there daydreaming, and yeah, it definitely took definitely took quite a while. So that's pretty ballsy doing <laughs> doing that two weeks out. Yeah, and I think um, it wasn't like a, a move that I even connected the dots thinking, oh yeah, I've got Revenant in two weeks. <laughs> it wasn't until afterwards that we clicked. Oh, that was a bit foolish. Um, but maybe uh, because I get up and run, um, you know, all my training's done at 5.30 or whatever with no food and that yeah. can range up to two hours. And we weren't like big fat, uh, big carb eaters anyway. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, maybe that's why it didn't impact me as much. Yeah, I suspect that you might have been somewhere along that metabolic flexibility yeah. Um, yeah. pathway. I think when I, if you had have done that to me two years ago, um, even just training in the morning two years ago was was tough. Like I'd, I'd run low um, just after an hour of training in the morning Yeah. Um, two years ago. So you can definitely see that 
that that wasn't happening when I went fully ketogenic, but there was still a lot of room to go. So yeah, the continuum yeah. is is quite long, and yeah, I've definitely seen what it's like to be at one end where I was two years ago, and finally now I think I might have made it to the other end. <laughs> yeah. When I can, yeah, just kind of keep keep training for as long as I long as I want. Um, doesn't really matter if I eat or not. I seem to be able to keep burning. And yeah. the the, the and mental like, the such... mental side as well seems to still be there. Yeah. What were we saying? Yes. And yeah, some of my trainings, like first thing in the morning without eating, would be like hard out stairs and hill sessions, mm. um, and they were all fine. Like still having energy at mm-hmm. the end of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's another really good point. Early on, when I was um, low carb, I was doing just steady, easy sessions, and I could do three hours, and and that was fine. But it wasn't. I think the real proof was when I could go out and do some harder sessions in the morning. And I even yeah. did a, a couple of races on, I mean, with, with no carbohydrate in sight and the, and actually perform at a, at a higher level. Uh, noticing my, my heart rate was going a lot higher and my, my power output or, or speed was a, a lot higher than that previous ceiling. Did you did you yeah. notice that ceiling? It's not something you really need to be too concerned about when your race takes twenty more than <laughs> sixty hours. Like if you if you're above a certain ceiling of intensity, then you're I mean you're not going to survive the race anyway. But did you notice that ceiling in any of your shorter training sessions? No, I don't think I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, definitely definitely diff- different athletes have come from doing a lot more high intensity stuff so having that ceiling shaved off my quality sessions yeah quite significantly i couldn't do anything tempo like was impossible um early on yeah Yeah, well it's certainly interesting um, to hear some stories of people playing around with playing around with that stuff and i think there's a lot more to be learned um and i don't know when don't know yeah that some coaches starting to use it a bit more um, in a more standardized way, but for the most part, it seems like a lot of us are just just playing around with with our own bodies and see how seeing how they respond. Yeah, and I think it, it definitely is that um, uh, it's, it's so individualized that it's hard for a coach to um, sort of prescribe something because um, even between the two of us, we've shown that you know the, the same sort of thing, but it can impact uh, people in such different ways. Um, that it's hard to prescribe something. It's very experimental for each person. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, there's definitely still a lot of, I think, um, untested assumptions around from uh, a lot of people and a lot of coaches. So um, things that might be working might not be the only way, only way to do it. So you know, it's, yes. it's always it's always yeah. slow progress when I think everyone's. And maybe not entrenched just in the right word, but have have seen something work. You know, it's not it's not people being like wrong and stubborn about it. Like there seems to be a lot of benefit to doing the the high carb approach. Um, yes. But there seems to be some yeah. other ways to get similar results that might be slightly better or, or maybe maybe slightly worse depending on the individual. So yeah, still still a long way to go. But I mean, I, I remember just three years ago, my nutritionist saying okay this is what we're going to do <laughs> you're not going to eat <laughs> and like i was like what <laughs> that's gonna, not going to work <laughs> you're not going to have your huge bowl of oats on two days per week and i was like what <laughs> and so yeah i'm sure i've come around and i'm sure a lot of other people will will come around but um yeah i'm back on back on the oats in a couple of days where we're going we're going back high carb for a little bit and I'm just just still playing around. There's lots of other things to to try out. So yeah, it's not, I think, not um, like in one camp or the other camp. Yeah, I think there's a lot of space for experimentation. Yeah, and different periodization around it as well. Um, lots of the podcasts and things I've listened to um, from some of the top ultra runners. Um, uh, it's not been one way fully um, high carb, no Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, high carb or, or no carb, it's in 
somewhere in between and at different parts of your training or leading up to and during a race you might be more carbs than you are mm-hmm. in a normal day life mm-hmm. yep yep i'm ex- hoping to see a see a lot more of that a lot more of that happening it's a whole new dimension of uh, things to get excited about and, and test and try different things yeah and that's not till after doing like for me doing something like the revenant and adding up what you actually had to eat during that mm-hmm. 58 hours then like cheap as i say that <laughs> yeah it was um yeah it was you know not a lot of solid food mm-hmm. um I was, I've been writing up race reports sort of on a piecemeal basis because it's mm-hmm. such a long thing. Um, and adding it up, and it's a, yeah, it's bugger all food. But I have no low energy bonks as far as, you know, outside the sleepiness side of things um, and no gut issues throughout the, the whole thing. Yeah, wow. that That's really important, yeah. I think, because there's such big problems um, that people have been noticing over the past years as ultra running has become more and more popular it seems that h- half of the people who dnf that they pull out from some gi related issues and of course there's also yeah. hydration going into that but um for a big part in my my problems with gi issues while racing i think it is a, a volume thing um yep. because i also i do training that's even a lower intensity and yeah trying to get through the required carbohydrate through the system bottlenecks at, at some point around 60 grams it's just 50 to 60 grams per hour of carbohydrates in the form of whole foods and gels mixing the two together it's it's tough after three hours of doing that i cannot squeeze yeah. any more in and it's just a numbers game at that point I, I, I start topped up and if i can only replenish this quantity per hour then you can predict how you can predict basically when i hit the wall <laughs> yeah um, the, the next application for, I think, this kind of stuff might be adventure racing, but it, it doesn't seem to be getting there yet. Or maybe you're closer to the um, to the action on, on that. Do you know many of the adventure racers who are starting to play around with um, diet and nutrition, or fueling in particular? No. Um, and I haven't really thought about it, but thinking about it now, maybe they are already advanced in it by simply by the nature of how much um they can take uh, especially on these like the expedition races um physically being able to carry enough food and that they've already probably been restricting their intakes Mm -hmm. um more than they would ideally if they were shorter races or if they had the capacity to carry Mm -hmm. as much yeah, so I suspect a lot of them. Been doing it. Yeah, much like you in your training, I suspect a lot of these guys have been training metabolic flexibility inadvertently. Um, yeah, just over the yeah. years, like doing if you're doing two five day expedition races per year, as far as I can tell, that's going to be very similar physiology to doing a five day fast when you're not yeah. training. You're running at a caloric deficit, and at some stage during those five days your body's going to have to come up with the, the fuel um, from fat at some stage. And there's this interesting phenomena that the adventure racers report that there's often a low point in, in their race. They often have a point after two days, and it's different for everyone, that they're really struggling, and then they come right again. And it just yeah. struck me as a very similar story to uh, the 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 extended fast, whether that's like just having a few hundred calories per day or no calories per day, those of us that have played around with that notice that day two or three is the worst, and then you then your body sorts itself out. Yeah, and yeah. it just struck me as a really similar story, and the the mechanics of that make sense. You're running at a caloric deficit; your body has to switch into burning fat at some stage, but it's a bit of a struggle to get your body to do that. At first, so yeah, I'm, I'm watching, and I guess you might be watching too to see if it picks up in adventure racing. Yeah, it's been more um, formal, I guess, rather than happening without them knowing it. Yeah. Sweet. So, um, what else have you been up to recently? Um, you, you had Revenant. Were, were there any other races that you've done 
Uh, so the next one after event was going to be the um, the one that also organised the uh, Riverhead um, Backyard the Relapse, mm-hmm. um, which was meant to happen on the 3rd of April. Um, mm-hmm. So that was my next goal was to um, to try and win that. So I got the golden ticket to Biggs in October. Um, and Biggs is the, the original, is that right? Yeah, the original Backyard. Um, so mm-hmm. now um, it's... Yeah, massively popular and it's sort of become the world champs of the backyard or last person standing format. Yeah. Um, so there's um, there's now 34 countries that um, have their own backyards and some. Wow. Of like Already. Sweden has Sweden has like hundreds of them. They're like the most uh, prolific at backyard events. <laughs> but, wow. Um, there's th- 34 golden tickets that would. Um, uh, all in the entry into Biggs, and then the rest of the seventy odd field at Biggs would be um, local US people or the top ten from last year. So it was it was shaping up to be a real uh, yeah world champs of of that wow. format. Wow, wow, that, that's pretty interesting. Something that I didn't see coming. Um, but people obviously love it. And yeah, what's your experience? What are your stories from that style of racing? How does it compare psychologically to uh, just the normal format ultra. Uh, it, it's an amazing. <laughs> there's so much strategy in it for starters as to how you're going to run the loops. Um, so for those that don't know the the last person standing format, um, you run a, a four mile or six point seven k loop um, on trail, and you have to do one of those per hour. Um, so on the hour it restarts, so if you do a, a 45 minute loop, um, then you've got the rest of that hour to, to rest and eat and drink and whatever else you want to do. Um, and then on the hour everybody lines up and, and goes again, and it keeps going until the last person standing. And so um, the strategy is whether you do fast laps, so you've got more rest time, um, and one of the guys in last year's um, Biggs, um, Campbell Dave from uh, from Canada, he he did fast laps, um, like sub forty minute laps. Okay. And then he jumped into those um, uh, those leg things that inflate and deflate. Yeah, the things. the um, compression boots. Yep. So he'd jump into those and just rest for the. Um, 20 minutes or whatever and later on he'd be sleeping for as much of that as he could every lap and you verse that against someone like Katie Wright who is our New Zealand representative and she'd be more doing longer times for each lap and having less time to rest so that um, their legs weren't getting cold because she's happier um, just trudging out there rather than stopped and and getting stuff each lap. Mm. And, and when are people eating? And, uh, the same as during the ultra. It's a huge variety. I guess the um, the GI issues actually are worse because people get tempted to, you know, eat on every time they come back or drink a truckload every time they come back to base because um, it's easy because <laughs> you're right. coming back to an aid station every 6.7 kilometres. Um, so that's a bit of a trap for a new beast mm. for that format. Um, versus, you know, just um, sipping something when you're out there and and trying to stick as much to normal meal routines as possible mm. is what I was aiming for. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting it's problem a, to solve. Yeah, and then it's really weird when you're out there running because, um, you know, several times last year when, when I was running, you'd come up to somebody and like, I passed you like, two hours ago and then <laughs> you're in front of me again um, because everybody restarts so it's yeah. quite a social format to start with yeah um are there any are there any other people having trouble on the course or is there it's short enough that people have they they know how long they're going to take for the next loop and that tends to go to plan or do you find there are some people who actually have been going too fast for too long and kind of crack mid loop? Um, I think early on um, it's more people you know deciding to quit 
when they get back to base. That's mm-hmm. you know, you sit down in a chair and you put your blanket on, <laughs> <laughs> have some food, and then they never get up again. <laughs> um, um, whereas a lot of the the um, the better runners will say they're never going to quit in the chair, and that's the mindset for the whole, you know, for the mission. Um, so that they have to quit then when they're out there because they've um, mm. you know, exhausted themselves and got delirious and, and get lost out on the course or they, they finally crack mm-hmm. um, with an injury or, or or tiredness or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it depends. I think the first, um, you know, 24 hours. So it's set up so that 24 hours is a 100 miler. Um, so that's a big milestone for lots of people. And Oh, I see. Um, okay. Yeah. And so um, the field's usually down to less than a quarter by that by that stage, um, and those people are all going to quit when they're out on the course due to some disaster, um, mm-hmm. rather than in their seats. Yeah, whatever it takes beyond that point, um, it's pretty yeah pretty, pretty crazy yeah. to see the yeah the limits people are are going. And I was really looking forward to this year because, like I said, I've been researching and practicing all this mental stuff and um and last year was more a physical thing that stopped me because i tore my achilles um at 183 k's um but mentally i was like i'd come through a a, a down patch because you know you're in and out of low patches good patches mm-hmm. and i'd had quite a bad patch that I'd, I'd gone through and i was like um, energetic and ready to go again until, until the Achilles. So this year, um, yeah, I was hoping to be a lot stronger and, and get to try the mental stuff more rather than mm. the physical barrier. Mm. What kind of mental stuff were you looking into? Uh, so um, it's all around changing that perceived limit. Um, so the notion that there's a, um, a governor of the brain that's saying, your body's tired um, and I guess the easy way to explain that um, is when you see a 100 metre um, runner do their, you know, um, a world record or whatever and theoretically they should have given everything they could and be absolutely wasted at the finish line um, but they can usually still do a lap quite speedily victory lap holding the flag <laughs> mm-hmm. um so you know your your brain will say that you're totally fucked and you've gone as fast as you can yeah um but in actual fact your body's still got quite a bit in reserve mm-hmm. and so trying to bypass that perceived limit through um you know things like self-talk and um and um cues like the smiley face on your your hand or, or um a distraction to the like we talked about at the start, distraction to yeah. the brain so that your body keeps going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Th- these are these are definitely techniques that I think um, people need to try. And you can also, I think, notice when the the going does get quite tough, at least uh, in in the setting of development sport, uh, it was noticeable that there was a certain group of people who uh you would you'd have there's a high chance that okay these these certain people are going to pull out of this race because the going's getting pretty tough and then there's a certain portion of people who who relish the grind who seem to for whatever reason have by default a more positive self-talk kind of a, a yeah yeah just a more positive narrative that comes up in these tough times and some people have a more negative narrative and that was my first noticing of that but it's then another step that you're saying to begin to hack the system and actually try to change your own your own habits what is your what was your tendency growing up were you someone who just relished the grind and have you noticed any improvements to your your mindset over the years uh, yeah, I think I've always been able to relish the grind and I like training hard and, and running hard and happy to push through the, um, you know, the, the first pain barrier or when it gets uncomfortable. Um, so I think I'm naturally good at that and have been for, 
um, quite a while. I think it's a lot of people don't get the chance to push that further because the nature of what they're doing, um, they might um, not need to. But the the real longer stuff that I'm doing, you have to to get to the end. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I've been trying to focus on, um, like I train physically, um, trying to research and and build practices to try and and build that stuff, mm -hmm. that that stuff even more. Yeah. Um, and I, I yeah, haven't really had a chance to test it because um, it's been more serious over the last year after last year's revenant that I've, I've been working on it. And mm -hmm. this, year's, this year's revenant went so good. Um, everything seemed to go, it was almost my perfect race that I didn't yeah. need to dig into it. And um, yeah, the relapse um, was going to be the next chance to get into it and then India in August, but um, all of that's seeming to be uh, postponed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? Who knows when yeah. things are going to actually happen? Yeah, so, so, so yeah, yeah, I think that's a matter of each person. I mean, everybody, no matter what the distance, will, will struggle at stages. And if you've got even an inkling of um, trying some of it um, beforehand, before you need it, and um, then it's going to be just another tool that you've got to, mm -hmm. to get through the tough times. Yeah, my my current thinking around this is um, this. There seems to be some ways to to motivate yourself to perform harder in a more push sense. Um, there are just positive self talk, and you know, what, do, have you followed David Goggins at all? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so he he's the epitome of, of the push strategy and it's just just all hype and like just just push to be like the total beast be the maddest beast you can possibly imagine and, yeah, and that's the aggressive that's, approach yeah the aggressive approach and and just just going hard and then there's a, another approach which is realizing that there's often this negative self-talk and you could just flatten that over with the David Goggins approach or you could take the other approach to calm the mind a lot more and remove this this kind of object that is the, these thoughts coming there's this negative self-talk about oh, it's too hard it hurts too much this is bad and quieting that down is I think another approach and possibly both used together to produce the similar effect um, have you paid any attention to any in any moments of weakness to see what was going on going on in your mind as far as whether it's negative or, or yeah positive. yeah have have there noticed are there some moments in the past where you have cracked and do you think the solution in those moments is you know that david goggins push harder to be um, the most badass you can possibly be or <laughs> maybe just relaxing and realizing that everything's going to be fine you can just keep keep trucking along have you noticed noticed those two approaches yeah and i think it, um somebody like for me i think um each approach has its own time and place and um, so if i think of the revenant last year um uh i needed to be more on the um taking a breather and um and stepping back a bit and um, more that gentle approach. Um, not so much the, yeah, I guess the positive, um, but it was more brain fatigue that, that happened in the end from the, the aggro and adrenaline. Um, you know, there was some checkpoints that are in the wrong, wrong spot on the map or on the physical land and it just built up. Um, I guess the yeah, as the brain fade that got in the end, and I think um, if I, that's why leading up to this year's revenue, I was very much you know doing some meditation, um, having some uh, key things that I words that would pull me back to um, take a step back and just relax a bit, and take and you know have another go at something. Um, sort of like traditional orienteering where you relocate but for your brain 
go yeah. back to a known feature, chill out for a bit, and then have another yeah. go at it. Um, as opposed to where um, if David Groggins is um, yelling and, and just something in my, in <laughs> <Yeah>. my head, <laughs> it wouldn't will, will have helped at all. Whereas um, yeah. in, a, in a more traditional ultra, so like the um, the relapse, like backyard, uh, sorry, last person standing format type thing, um, at, at parts there, then a more David Goggins approach would be more beneficial, I think, because of mm -hmm. the environment where, you know, just one more lap, that's all you mm -hmm. have to do, put one foot in front of the other, one more lap, and you just have to do that over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it varies depending on the, on the, um, the situation even for yeah. the same person. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of bring up that idea of meditation, which is still a, um, a strange concept to a lot of people, but, and I'm not sure if it's possible to apply some of those techniques in ultra running. Um, there's certainly some people who think so. And I, have you seen, are you familiar with the transcendence ultra? I think it's, yes. it's the US. Yeah. They just run around that block. For three thousand like, kilometers, it's so mind-numbing. It's, it's, yeah. it's just a flat concrete square, right? Like, it's, maybe it's not as bad now. The standard has been changed now that I've been watching <laughs> the quarantine, <laughs> the quarantine ultra. Um, but the, the the philosophy behind that is is that you've the only thing you've got left with in that moment is the suffering you're currently experiencing. There's there's not nice scenery. There's, there's not a nice course you're just running around this block and you're just left with your mind facing this continual anguish really and i just noticed that yeah that was a big similarity between a lot of the meditation practices where you're just accepting that whatever's coming at you is going to come at you and it's probably not going to hurt and it's unlikely to hurt as much as your reaction to it, your emotional reaction to it, and yeah, I, I think there's definitely some um, some learnings to be had there by by some people about realizing that a lot of the struggling in ultras is their reaction to the possibility of stuff getting worse, and it's not actually that they're struggling a huge amount in the in the current moment. So um, yeah, there, there could be some some tools there uh, tools there to use. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, definitely. Like when I um, was saying before about in the in the longer stuff, the ultras, um, people go through lows and highs throughout, and you might have one low, um, or you might have a, a series of lows. But each time you do come out the other end, um, and you've kind of pulled yourself together, either physically or and or mentally, and having those techniques that you just talked about, and that's how I sort of have used. Um, meditation um, it's to sort of refocus mm -hmm. and know that um, I'm in a low patch right it's time to focus on something um, uh, and it might be an object or it might be your breathing and yep. coming out the other end and right I've regrouped let's uh, we're off again mm -hmm. and um, it's kind of forgotten that that low patch that you had yeah. Um, so that's sort of how I use the meditation, and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Rather than look, rather, rather than looking at ultra as one big massive thing, um, it is in, in stages, and if you, those sorts of tools can help you throughout. Yep. 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 Um, the danger about looking at it as yeah one big thing is it just seems overwhelming, and um, especially yeah. if you're if you're yeah. struggling mid race in an ultra. The more you think about how far away that finish line is, just the more unnecessary suffering that you're going to have to go through. And yeah, just being able yeah. to calm the mind down and stop thinking of the things that are getting you completely jacked and um, just thinking about the things you can control or even thinking about nothing at all, which meditation might suggest is um, somewhere in the vicinity of the goal. Um, might might be a yeah. really helpful tool for a lot of people. Yeah. Have, have you read the book Endure? No. By, um, Alex no, Hutchinson. I'm familiar with it. Heard a lot of people um, yeah. recommending it. I haven't read it. 
it's what's really your take good. home from that? I mean, it's really good on this mental side of things um, and pushing the, the perceived limit. Um, and it's a real easy read too. It's not sort of high, um, mind-numbing and that it's made up lots of stories looking at not just running but different sports. So like um, deep diving people and um, mm -hmm. yeah, all sorts of different sports. And um, it breaks it down into different techniques and uh, ways where things that you can draw. So whether it's fueling or um, cold or heat or whatever. Um, and it's just, yeah, there's lots of little tidbits of things that people can take away depending on what sport they do. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And it's often really useful to pop out into another sport and just look at something that on the surface might not seem relevant, but if it helps you look at something from a different perspective, then yeah, may, yeah. maybe that's the aha moment um, yeah. that you really need yeah, totally. when there's, yeah. Yeah. Then, um, there's a good thing in there. Um, I mentioned before about the happy face, the smiley face, and the it's probably the most quoted study that <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> that comes out of that book that gets quoted all the time with the cyclists that are doing the um, a test to exhaustion, mm -hmm. and some of them have got this um, smiley face that's flicked up on the screen in front of them, in front of yeah. their um, their bikes, in the lab. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that they can't even see it, so it's like a sixteenth of a second or something. So they're not actually aware that it was there. Yeah. Um, but they go. I can't remember what percentage it is now. But I think yeah. It might have been twelve percent further than the ones that that didn't. Yep. Yeah, I definitely take some some convincing. I'm fairly skept <laughs> yeah. fairly skeptical by nature, but I do think there is some some truth in that line of uh, line of thought and. Whether that study shows it or not, um, I, I don't know if that really matters. I think a lot of people do experience a, a, yeah, just, and a, lot a, of a the... sudden change depending on some, something that was really irrelevant but had a profound emotional change on them, totally changed the course of their race. And yeah. there's, there's enough yeah. examples of that that yeah, I, I think something in, in that vicinity has to be true. And, and that's fairly big and ultra now. Um, you know, to tell your support crew to <laughs> to have like big happy smiley faces and telling jokes yep. and that when you come into aid stations now, rather than looking dire because you look like a like like you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Hide that shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or look on your face and instead have a smile because that, that passes on to the runners and and likewise um, runners coming in and you know been uh, thanking their support crews and aid station people and any marshal they see giving a big cheer and, and mm -hmm. smile because each time you do that you're picking yourself up mm -hmm. a little bit further yeah 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 that's something i can definitely reflect on from my my limited ultra experience at races like kepler where the yes. the, aid, the aid stations are cranking like they've they've had this little competition in the race for some time i imagine where you know there's a is an award goes to the aid station for being the top yeah, aid station. Yeah. And so yeah, they're trying to compete uh, with the, Yeah, that's right. That incentive works. The aid stations go bonkers. And as a participant in the race, you just extract all this positive energy whenever you come through these aid stations. And yeah, you try, yeah, you try to go noticeable. slowly out of an aid station. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got it's quite a faster. Yeah, exactly. I go faster yeah. out of the aid you station because I'm so pumped. Yeah. <laughs> at all of my uh, um, volunteer briefings that for our events that we organise our runs and things, um, that's one of the main things. Like health and safety gets talked about, but one of the main things I tell them is not to stand there like a a dead fish, just pointing a, a flag in the direction that runners go. Like dance around, have some fun because yep. it's, it's infectious for the runners. It gives them yep. every time they see it, they get a boost. Mm -hmm. Yep, and be prepared as well. Um, I noticed that I've done some races where it looks like there was some uh, logistics issues, and we've got to the aid station, being some of the earlier runners coming through a bit, you know, ahead of schedule or something, and they have been set up, and you know, we're already suffering, and now we're pissed that the water's <laughs> not ready, and and yep. it just goes backwards the other way. Like all this negativity just came from a situation that like didn't need to cause any negativity at all. Yeah. So the, the opposite is, is also true. Yeah. 
Um, a story I did want to share with you that I thought you might be interesting, you might be interested in, and maybe some of the listeners are as well. And it was a, about meditation again, which is <clears throat> different and not necessarily applicable. But I did um, a Vipassana 10 day silent retreat last year, which I, um, I mentioned to you. And I'm not sure whether there's application, but during that experience, so what basically happens is you're doing 10 hours of meditation a day where you're just focusing on the breath basically or focusing on a certain part of your body really closely so it's just like maniacally repetitive and yeah. strange things happen to your brain basically and in in short your concentration goes through the roof in a way that i found pretty incredible uh, i could like concentrate without distraction on on one particular thing by the end of that 10 days in, in a way that I didn't think my brain was capable of. Um, and also you can get yourself into a bit of a state where there is just no downside to anything. There is just nothing could hurt you. You essentially, this is the transcendent experience where you are, are separate from the things that we would traditionally define as, as painful. And yeah, in, in those moments, I mean, I felt like, I could have been shot through the chest and like nothing bad would have come of that. As far as suffering and, and happiness, I would have just been totally content and content in observing my own device. I, I, that's I, obviously that was not tested, but that's kind of what it felt like. And I was like, man, like what is the application of this? If you could harness that, then this whole ultra thing would be a piece, piece of cake. <laughs> yeah. It would just be it, like, it might be do I much. run or do I not run? Yeah, it might. You, you would do just immense damage because yeah. the choice yeah. to run is is like a remote decision. It's like you're playing a computer game. If you really get the meditation cranking to that degree, you basically feel like you're playing a computer game. You were just yeah. deciding you're based decide. on, yeah, you're just deciding this is the strategy I want to employ. I will keep running. Whereas the current state of us doing an ultra running is like, do I really want to put myself through this? This really sucks. Like, I would rather stop. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a total game changer. But of course, it, it, preparing for an ultra and rocking up on a start line and living a normal life and not compatible with, with <laughs> ten, 10 consecutive days of dinner, like, you, you get yourself into quite a state on those yeah. retreats so yeah i think you it's something a shortcut to, button. you do need a shortcut button um but maybe maybe with more practice um or perhaps there are more convenient ways like you say of just getting the getting the positive self-talk right and knowing when to discard a bad thought that is just not helpful um and maybe just some more more basic <laughs> meditation techniques might be more helpful than yeah, but I think um, have, having that process that you've been through now, um, uh, there should be uh, ways that you can, oh, I guess the goal is that you can find ways of getting not all the way to that state, but um, partially to that state where it's beneficial. So um, you might not get to that full state mm. where, because that would actually be bad because you'd, you'd push your body to it. It broke well, down. That's right. But if you try, if you could get halfway there, um, and not mm -hmm. have to, not have to go through such a process, then that yeah, would be the ultimate. I, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. Is that just because you can't employ the full force of that, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not transformative. Um, especially if you had someone who say was just they really bought into the idea that the discomfort of running, whatever that is for them. They really bought into the fact that the, to the idea that the discomfort of running is really bad for them, that that is actually the thing that's worth avoiding. It yeah. just it just shatters that whole notion. Um, just being in the experience where you've been sitting on your butt for four hours, you're so uncomfortable, you're so sore, and suddenly none of that matters. It just yeah. it just shatters your uh, the way we normally deal with things that are 
uncomfortable. Normally we get another cushion, we get a better chair, we, you know, design these comfortable worlds around us. And just to find yourself being totally satisfied, being totally uncomfortable, even just a glimpse of that, yeah, I think maybe o opens the door, leaves the door ajar for someone who's really stuck in the idea that um, I should listen to the pain all of the time. So yeah, yeah, you don't have to be able to harness the full force of that. Just a glimpse, I think, is um, beneficial. And then, and then yeah, knowing that you've done that in the past, being able to draw on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, that for the meditation, I do it knowing that there's no way when I'm doing an ultra that I'm going to be doing a, a meditation out there when it gets hard or whatever to try and refocus. But um, having the techniques that you've used during you know, basic meditation, then you can quickly focus over a small time frame um, mm. because you've you've done it in the past using longer time frames. It's hard yep. to explain. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's hard to explain and you don't that that's the reason people need to figure out how their own mind is working yeah, to then yeah. realize how they can apply it just saying what what seemed to be um useful for me um, i probably haven't described it well and it might even might not even be the the right solution for for somebody else but we'll see yeah there's there's plenty to play with this this whole new new sport that seems to have exploded in the past 10 years but i'm sure has a lot longer to go um, it seems to be somewhat addictive. People are, are finding that there's this challenge that you overcome is just so rewarding that people just keep coming back. And yeah, and I think part of that is because it is um, there is so much to learn and experiment with. Um, for each person, like even the top guys can't say that they've conquered it. Um, no. Like you might say you've conquered some other sport. Um, because there's so many facets to it, whether it be nutrition or hydration or mental or physical the, the training. And then each one of those breaks down into lots of different different things that you can experiment with. Mm -hmm. And you've got to flop these things out on the fly. On, so some of these things on the fly on race day, yeah. which um, leads itself yeah. open to yeah all sorts of things uh, going wrong, especially once the race day emotions start start biasing your decisions one way yeah, yeah so the good people have that toolkit that if something you know something will pop up then they know uh, different things that they can try on the, mm. on the fly to to mm -hmm. bring it back together again yep yep um that that reminds me i did a uh, podcast with with tom reynolds more from the perspective of him being a race doctor where he's his um little kind of race doctor business has done events like Tarawera Ultra last year and he talked about this concept of the uh the, the nutrition and the the gear plan b yep. always having this this plan b whether it's yeah the survival gear or or nutrition going the whole time and yeah maybe we need to be more serious about having like the mindset plan b as well knowing how am I going to recover my mindset when it uh, turns to turns to mush halfway around um, just it, it yeah, seems exactly. yeah, it seems like something that yeah. needs needs to happen because it, it will fall apart at, at one race sometime soon you will have a mental <laughs> a mental breakdown of, of some sort yeah exactly and that, that's what i've been trying to do over the last year um is having those techniques different techniques to try for when that happens so i look forward to when it does <laughs> that's right that's when, right when we can get back out there yeah thinking oh yeah. right i did i won revenant now and i didn't even need any of that stuff so let's not waste any more time um that i don't think that's the right approach yeah i think you need no, to keep developing keep, these mental plan b's yeah yeah and, and you'll and need it like, for sure and that will be a different a different technique that you'll need depending on uh, what stage of the race or what type of race or um, what what's failed <laughs> during that same race. Mm, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I would say good luck for your next race, but I have no idea when it's going to be. And no. I don't know when my next race is going to be, but um, it will happen. 
at some stage. And in the yeah, meantime, well, we can keep running local. And it's nice for you that you've got a little bit of bush to hang out in. Um, I've got a little local local trail as well. I can do a few little laps on. Um, and that'll have, have, to, okay. have to be it for now. And then we'll... It'll make it extra amazing when we get to go on a, you know, a big trip somewhere down south. It'll just make it extra amazing, I think, once we're free. Yeah, and I think um, if you think about what everybody's done, so just the, you know, the um, the backyard quarantine that's happening at the moment, and the the loony twenty four hour backyard thing that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a whole lot of much stronger people mentally from all this. Um, yeah. Those people that have you know worn tracks in their backyards. <laughs> going around and around. around. Yeah. There's, there's been some great development in, in those hours that you've done it. Um, compared to, I bet those people would never have thought um, of doing that before having to do it because of the situation and would yeah. never have considered that they would have been able to push themselves to do it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a lot of personal development and in terms of both stepping up to the challenge and also maybe letting go the obsession about having to do like the perfect trail every time you go out. Yeah, uh, yeah. And maybe both sides of that, people have realized that they were maybe stuck in the in the habit a little bit too much. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, it'd be definitely interesting to hear more more opinions on this when, when freedom does eventually come our way. Yeah, hopefully it'll make for a, when we put our event on, um, when we're all clear for the... Um, our last person standing at Riverhead. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it makes for a lot more people going longer. <laughs> yeah. they'll have experienced it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It'll be well practiced. They'll have the mental side of it sorted. It'll be luxurious yeah. to run that on a 6.5K <laughs> trail in the pine trees. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Sean. No, it's been, cool. uh, been really, cool, yeah. really cool talking. Uh, see you yeah, later. It's been cool. If you're enjoying the Perfect Flow podcast and want more value from it in the future, there are some ways you can support it. The first is to rate or leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or other platforms where it's available. The second is to share this podcast or specific episodes on social media or with friends. The third is to get involved more directly through the Perfect Flow page on Facebook, where I'm trying to construct a more interactive community. I want Perfect Flow to belong to the listeners, and if you tell me what topics you're most interested in, or even suggest specific guests, I'll do my best to make it happen. This is your opportunity to be part of something that answers your questions and adds value to your life. Another good reason to follow Perfect Flow on Facebook is that I post links to episodes, blog posts, and anything I find useful to this page. It's a great way to follow my training, racing, and learning. Another great way to stay engaged is to subscribe to genebeverage.nz. This way you will get podcasts and blogs emailed to you, avoiding the clutter of Facebook. I don't know where this project will take us, but the reception so far has been positive. Who knows where we might be in a few years.